Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm um, Neil, a Calvinist from cold and cloudy West Michigan. We basically know how to experience gloom and how to cause it. <laughs> you know what the topic is. We're going to talk this afternoon about forgiving those who hurt us. This is an exercise in pastoral theology. And I'll begin by quoting from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, who says, We have been saved by grace through faith, and this is not our own doing, but the gift of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I understand grace to be a form of love, an undeserved form. And I understand that um, forgiving somebody who has hurt us is a form of grace. The first thing I want to uh, accent is that forgiving someone who has hurt us is a generous act, and it is an act of imitation. We all admire it, C.S. Lewis said, as when we watched Pope John Paul II forgive his would-be assassin, Mehmet Ali Agka, reaching out to him in his would-be assassin's prison cell. Never forget that some of the photos of that showed a bewildered Muslim trying to figure out what this was, uh, forgiveness being offered by the Pope. We all admire forgiveness, said C.S. Lewis, until we have to do it. Forgiveness of the sins of other people is hard work. It's a piece of grace that is hard work. And it's hard work even to get exactly straight on what we are doing when we forgive somebody who has offended us. In fact, anybody who thinks hard about forgiveness will probably start a whole lot more rabbits than he catches. The topic raises questions, and the good answers are seldom going to be the easy ones. To see this, let's take a case. Suppose that you are a lonesome, middle-aged Christian woman who has finally met a suitable man. He speaks gently, he laughs musically, he reads widely, he walks you through spring air that's laden with the scent of a thousand lilacs, points out the nesting habits of finches and especially of the golden ones. He relishes a good Sunday sermon and later can recall whole swatches of it while he cooks your Sunday dinner. <laughs> this charming man is so unimaginably attentive that he fills you with a sense of hope, a sense of promise, with so much trust and love and longing that you never do ask why he wants to arrange a joint checking account before you've even gone on your honeymoon. After he cleans you out, he disappears immaculately and then shows up on a list of people with felony warrants. He has done this before. He's got a couple of aliases, he's got a couple of previous convictions, and now you have to face a terrible truth. You have been betrayed, and you never saw it coming. In fact, it's a mark of really skillful con men that even when they have been exposed, their victims sometimes still can't believe it. Now some questions. What would have to happen for you to forgive this louse? Would he have to repent? But what if you never see him again? Could you forgive him anyway? As a Christian, must you forgive him? For his sake or for yours? What if you try to forgive him, but can't? May your minister, who is sedate in his wisdom and serene in his own marriage, May he urge you to forgive, but if you can't, wouldn't that just add a load of guilt to your trauma? And anyhow, isn't forgiveness almost too good for bigamists and thieves? C.S. Lewis used to ponder this. Isn't there something that feels almost unjust about forgiveness, that something that seems to trivialize the offense and invite repeat instances of it? May people just go around hurting Christians, changing their lives, and then count on these Christians to come through with a nice little burst of forgiveness? 
Suppose you do eventually succeed in forgiving our Laos. Does that mean that you must then take him back into your life somehow? Would it mean that you would like him better than you used to? Would it mean that you would not agree to testify at his bigamy trial? What I want to do this afternoon is to try to locate forgiveness of sins of other people, locate it theologically, and then to describe the actual machinery of forgiveness, what we do when we undertake to forgive a person who has offended us. And then finally, I want to remark on certain features of forgiveness that I think are especially striking or noteworthy. I should add that I very much like the theory of forgiveness in the writings of Robert C. Roberts. Uh, Bob Roberts is my friend. He used to teach at Wheaton College. He now teaches at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. I really like uh, his treatment of forgiveness, and I am going to, in some respects, restate it this afternoon with plenty of wrinkles of my own. But let me begin by trying to place forgiveness of sins theologically. The doctrinal bases for the Christian act of forgiving somebody who has offended us are two, primarily. The doctrine of justification. You know, when, when God justifies sinners, one of the things that justification includes is the forgiveness of the sins of the sinner. The doctrine of justification and, on the other side, the doctrine of dying and rising with Christ. I was just talking with uh, Pastor Dave Jaspers over here in the, before the event began and was telling him that I've concluded that in the writings of Paul, uh, dying and rising with Christ is the biggest dynamic of the Christian life. It's the biggest way that the Christ life gets ironed in. And that Paul seems to have four distinct senses of dying and rising with Christ. One is that we did it mystically or communally or federally in some respect when he did it. He's the second Adam, the head of a whole new race. So just as um, all the rest of the human race was somehow involved in the first Adam's sin, so the whole race of believers is involved in the second Adam's actual dying and rising. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes. Second sense of it is uh, that we died and rose with Christ in our baptism. Here's the going down and coming up imagery. Uh, it's why immersion is the right mode, not sprinkling. Sprinkling is just getting used to the water, and I come from a church that sprinkles. I think it's not a very good symbol. Now, the third form of dying and rising is the kind that you find in Colossians 2 and 3. Colossians 2, it's the baptism form of it. In Colossians 3, it's the mortifying of our old self and the vivifying of our new self. So it's as if Paul says, since you have been raised with Christ, now keep the rhythm going. Keep on dying and rising with Christ. Put to death your old self with all of its lusts and wrath and greed and pornea and all the rest. And then let your new self arise. It's all baptismal imagery. It's as if we're wearing a new baptismal gown. Since you've been raised with Christ, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, love, and thanksgiving. So those are three forms of dying and rising with Christ. When he did it, when we got baptized, when every day we try to mortify our old self and vivify our new one through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And all that is rehearsal for the day we actually physically die, and for the day in the general resurrection when we are physically raised with Christ. When the day comes for us to physically die, the idea will be not new to us. We've been dying and rising our whole lives. Now, so doctrine of justification and the doctrine of dying and rising with Christ, and the, you know, forgive your neighbor as, uh, as Christ forgave you, as God forgave you, so you, you must also forgive others in Colossians 3 that all stems from since you have been raised with Christ. So justification and dying and rising with Christ are the two main heads over forgiveness of sins. John Calvin thought of justification as God's acceptance of guilty sinners 
into his favor, forgiving their sins and imputing Christ's righteousness to them. God forgives us in justification. It is therefore fitting that we would forgive others. And as you know, there is a terrifying hookup of these two forms of forgiveness, gods of us and us of others, in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. O God, forgive us our sins, debts, trespasses, as we have also forgiven those who have sinned, incurred debt, trespassed against us. Charles Williams once said that word as is the most terrifying conjunction in all the Bible. What's striking is that this is the one petition Jesus wants to comment on. So he teaches his disciples to pray in Matthew 6. Then Jesus immediately turns to this one petition in the prayer that is going to cause consternation to his disciples, and he explicates it for them. He says, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, then neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. In other words, as C.S. Lewis said, forgive or be damned. And this way of looking at the matter is confirmed by our Lord's parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. How often must I forgive a fellow member of the community? Peter wants to know as many as seven times. Oh, Peter, you're thinking small, says Jesus. Think big. Not seven times, but 77 times. And then follows the parable of the unforgiving servant, the one who was forgiven, but who wouldn't forgive others, and who ends up getting handed over to the torturers. Now, lots and lots of questions here. But one thing is obvious, no matter which questions you want to raise, one thing is obvious. It appears that to Jesus, the readiness to forgive somebody who has offended us is really important. It's an, oblig an obligation that he terrifyingly reinforces. Now, why? What, why all the fuss about this one? I think because an unforgiving heart is a hard heart, and God can't do much with a hard heart. An unforgiving heart is so obvious a sign that we have missed that God wants to forgive us. Forgiveness of others is an obvious sign of gratitude for our own forgiveness, so that failure to do it looks an awful lot like evidence of ingratitude. And ingratitude, of course, is a form of alienation from God. So forgiveness, you know, as an imperative, forgiving others may amount to a kind of behavioral modification, and more on that in just a moment. So forgiving others is important to soften our hard hearts, and it's important to demonstrate our gratitude, but there's another reason. When we are closed in, walled off, when we hang on to our bitterness and our wrath, we are in no position to be one of the ligaments within the church. All those virtues, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, gratitude, love, gratitude, they're all ligaments of the Christian community. They all tie us together. And forgiveness is one of the really strong ones. And when we neglect it, that ligament just isn't there. Okay. Forgiving the sins of others is a form of dying and rising with Christ. It's mortifying to forgive somebody who has hurt me. It's a shot into, my, into the old self of my hard heart that now has wanted to hold others' offenses against them. Now if I forgive them, I'm taking out a contract in my old self. Uh, by the way, um, L. Gregory Jones, Duke Divinity School, wrote a book embodying forgiveness, which is excellent on this point that when we undertake to forgive somebody else, what we are doing is crucifying our old self, our hard heart. Forgiveness of another who has offended me mortifies my old self and raises up my new one. 
When we forgive, we are making the sign of the cross and then rejoicing in the empty tomb. So each time we absorb the evil that is sent our way without passing it back, and so cut the loop of vengeance, we are simply imitating our Lord Jesus Christ who did that in his atonement. Why forgive? Because it is commanded by the one who has forgiven us, because it fits people who have been raised with Christ, because it's fitting to do it, because it's part of the natural rhythm of dying and rising with Christ. Forgiveness, the readiness to forgive others, is a natural part of the uniform of the people of God. It fits us just right. Now the second part of my talk, what do we actually do when we undertake to forgive somebody who has offended us? And here I've learned a lot from my friend Bob Roberts and principally from his volume titled Taking the Word to Heart. What Roberts really does is sort of Christian psychology. He's an expert on what forms of psychological thinking and practice fit pretty well with the Christian faith, which ones fit uncomfortably, and which ones don't fit at all. Okay, to forgive another person is to nullify the offense that this person has committed against you. And how do you do that? Well, you have something against another person, namely his offense, the fact that he has offended you, and what you do when you forgive that person is to drop anger you have a right to. And what does that mean concretely? I think it means two things, and I think these two things parallel justification and sanctification or conversion. One of the things that we do when we forgive somebody else is a quasi-legal move. We pardon the offender's offense. That is, we remit the debt of punishment he owes us. He strikes us, we do not strike him back. He insults us, we do not insult him back. She ignores us, isolates us, freezes us out, we do not return the favor. We cut the loop of retaliation, we absorb evil without passing it on. That's the pardon side. And I think it's a really important dimension of forgiveness, but it's got some problems in it that have gotten me stumped, at least for now. So <clears throat> I'm not going to say much more about pardon as a part of forgiveness. I mean, uh, here are some of the questions that I have not been able to find really terrific answers to. Do we have a right to revenge as Christians? If not, you know, vengeance belongs to the Lord. If not, how can we give up a right we don't have? Or do we have a natural right that we are commanded to lay aside in imitation of God? Well, how does that bear on punishment in our homes and in the state? Can we forgive the person who assaults us and still want the state with, who, with whom we have a social contract to punish this person by putting them in jail? Those are some <clears throat> good questions which we will simply bracket and set aside. So let me move on to the other understanding of forgiveness not the pardon part, but the existential part, dropping anger that we have a right to. To make a move on our own anger is an ambitious thing to do. To forgive another person, a person who has offended us, says Roberts, is to give up your anger for the sake of the offender and for the sake of your relationship to her. The person you forgive is an offender. This person is to blame. This person has sinned. When we talk about forgiveness, we're talking about the forgiveness of sin. We're not talking about excusing somebody's behavior. Excuses are for blameless errors or mild indignities. You call the wrong number, or you have to step in front of somebody, or you are unavoidably tardy for something, you say, excuse me. Please excuse me. Forgiveness is not the same thing as excusing, because excusing implies no blame and therefore no offense. Something similar is true of tolerance. Tolerance, as Bob Roberts says, implies an open, uh, accepting attitude toward differences in taste and style. A moral relativist, a truly moral relativist, would typically have little to forgive because 
he would have little that he thought was actually an offense, actually a blameworthy sin. This is in the abstract. If in the concrete you are a moral relativist um, and had a bumper sticker that read, if it feels good, do it, and you took this as an invitation to punch the moral relativist in the face uh, on the ground that moral relativists uh, regularly need a good um, punch to the face, and besides it would make you really feel really good to do it, I doubt that he'd say, hey, go to it, pal. Um, my new friend Dave and I were talking before the session about how today we're getting a whole lot of brain science that, in which um, <clears throat> scientists or philosophers will claim that our intentions, our emotions, our significant human impulses are really just bursts of brain activity. That's all they are. And they are not caused by us. They are caused by some uh, physical events. They are themselves physical events caused by other physical events. And there are plenty of writers these days who are willing to bite the bullet and say what follows is that the whole concept of free will is an illusion and that moral responsibility based upon it is also one and that uh, the whole idea that people are praiseworthy or blameworthy for their acts is just a remnant of the old style of thinking and no longer applies. Yesterday, uh, Ross uh, Douthat of the New York Times uh, was giving a little presentation in Miami and I was there and he said what's so interesting to him is that when people put forward the view that people are no longer to, uh, to be praised or to be blamed, they get really angry when you don't buy that and they blame you for not buying it. Okay, so when we forgive somebody who has offended us, we are not excusing, we're not um, tolerating, um, and we're not condoning either. Um, you know, blaming but only a little and taking sort of a nonchalant attitude toward the offender. People who have been cheated or lied to uh, but who are morally superficial do sometimes condone these things. They say, hey, no, no big deal, no harm, no foul. And this is especially true if they have a stake in a nonchalant attitude in this area, as when racist jurors refuse to convict, convict racist defendants. There they think, but for the grace of God, go I. So they're going to condone it. But forgiveness is a matter of giving up anger that you have a right to for the sake of the offender and for the sake of your relationship to him or her. It's a real offense with something really to be forgiven and real blame in the picture. Now, the second thing to notice about this is that anger is the thing that we have to drop. We have a passionately, we have passionate againstness where the offender's offense is concerned. And sometimes I believe you and I have a right to it. When we do, the name of our anger is indignation. The scriptural admonitions about anger, you know, anger is one of the seven deadly sins. Scriptural admonitions against anger, I believe, are largely against vengefulness and against irritability. But scripture appears to assume that there are times and seasons of justified anger, justified, righteous, passionate againstness. God is indignant a lot in scripture. And I think in the whole context of Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, the whole context assumes that we will sometimes be indignant with each other. Of course. Somebody who humiliates your child or mocks our Lord or accuses you carelessly, you will be passionately against these things. Anger in these cases, said my teacher Lewis Smeads, anger is then the executive passion of human decency. But then the question is what we're going to do with this anger. A person who forgives does something to her anger. If she is patient, she can put it into suspension for a while. You know, uh, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, that's macrothumia, means having a large capacity for absorbing irritants without getting paralyzed by them. A patient person has like a great big crankcase to put all the contaminants into. If she is patient, she will put her anger into suspension for a while, and if she is forgiving, she will give it up for the sake of the offender. And now my question is, is that really possible. Can we just 
operate on our emotions in this way to change them from hot to cool? Do we have some kind of internal switch we can throw to shut off the current that's driving our anger? Can we actually act against one of our own emotions and one of the most volatile of them? I think the answer has to be yes. The answer has to be yes. I do not believe that God commands us to do things that are impossible. The grace of God that forgives us can flow through us to others. But how does this work? Well, in his book, Embodying Forgiveness, L. Gregory Jones talks to his readers about what he calls the craft of forgiveness. Forgiving offenders is something that can be learned. And what does the craft of forgiving somebody who has offended me consist in? Well, it consists largely, and this is Bob Roberts' insight, it consists largely in purposely bringing to mind generous considerations that have a shot at softening my own heart. You deliberately bring to mind considerations, you could call them collateral considerations, that you think are very likely to soften your own heart. And what are some of these considerations that you would bring to mind? Well, first one, one that's implied in the parable of the unmerciful servant, one that's certainly taught in Jesus' comment on that one petition. The first thing that you bring to mind when somebody has offended you, or I do when somebody has offended me, is I bring to my mind this. I, too, am a sinner, much in need of forgiveness. But I have been forgiven much. How fitting it would be if I, in turn, would forgive the one or ones who have hurt me. I think this is so central a part of the teaching of Jesus that I, I find it to be quite an obvious one. Second one, this is especially true when the offender is maybe a member of our family or maybe um, a friend of some standing. Um, and this is Bob Roberts' suggestion. The offender and I have a long-time relationship. I want this relationship to continue. It's important to me. I am therefore going to try to bring to mind heart-softening considerations so that this relationship may go on. Um, I want us to live to tell stories and go to lunch. And if I don't drop my anger, it's going to all be over, and I don't want it to be over. You think, for example, when um, parents are the parents of children during the difficult years, how often that is a reigning consideration. Parents love us. They want this relationship to continue. And so they are going to do everything they can to drop the anger that they have a right to. Third, I will bring to mind that the offender may not be wholly to blame for his offense. He is to blame, else there's nothing to forgive, but aren't there mitigating circumstances? Was this person born irritable, for example? so that it is very hard for him to control his temper and to control the sharp tongue that's attached to his temper. Temperament may be a mitigating circumstance. There's a place in C.S. Lewis in which he comments on the fact that some people are born with such nasty temperaments that for them to be merely civil is to cause news in heaven. And then there are environmental mitigating circumstances. The, the kid that beats me up and robs me on a street at downtown Grand Rapids may have himself been more beat up than brought up. And if I am going to drop my anger against him, which I definitely have a right to because his upbringing does not get him off the hook, it's just mitigating, not determinative, 
But if I'm going to drop anger that I have a right to, I will definitely bring to mind that this kid's, kid has known violence and violence only for as long as he's lived. That's relevant. Fourth, intercessory prayer is a gateway to compassion and then to forgiveness. Prayer for an enemy opens up the way for generous considerations that my offender may not be demonic. He may simply be a sinner just like me. And he may be partly riven by the same forces as I am. Intercessory prayer for others and particularly for enemies opens the way to compassion and then to forgiveness. I'm remembering now that the priesthood of all believers in the Reformation had only a little to do with individual access to God. It has to do more principally with mutuality among us in the communion of believers. We are all priests for each other, which means we are all to be interceding, interceding for the one I hope to forgive. May help me to forgive him. And so I will attempt it. Fifth, I may feel compassionate toward the offender, just as God does in Hosea 11. I may reconstrue the offender. This is a favorite insight of Bob Roberts. I may deliberately reimagine him, not as a lazy and obnoxious slob who deserves to steep in his own juices, but instead as a fearful and struggling and wistful slob. Graham Greene once suggested that scorn is a failure of imagination. And so in Hosea 11, an angry God wants to punish his people by withdrawing, but God can't do it. Because as the passage says, because my compassion grows warm and tender, because my heart recoils within me, God's compassion works against the grain of God's own anger and softens it. Sixth, I may also soften my own anger against the offender by reminding myself that I may be partly complicit. In family squabbles, when husbands and wives tangle, for example, or parents and children, the mature peacemaker will look in his own heart to see what he contributed to the problem. Did I provoke my wife by once more assuming that things have to go my way? Did I foster carelessness about obligations in my son by promising to go to his home games and then turning up for only two of them? What's my complicity here? It's a consideration that can open the door to forgiveness. Sixth, a big one. What if the offender is remorseful or even repents? And I take it those are two very different things. Remorse is an emotion. It's feeling bad. Repentance is an amendment of life. In the Gospels, Luke 17, for example, which is a parallel to Matthew 18, it looks as if Jesus quite often assumes that repentance will be part of the picture whenever there is traffic in forgiveness. By the way, he also appears to assume that rebuke will be part of the picture as well, um, a delicate art that Christians have been slow to revive, the art of rebuke. When's the last time your church had a Saturday morning rebuke workshop? You know, where you would learn how to use minimum necessary force with regular increase in pressure as necessary. We don't do that so much anymore. Jesus does not say that repentance is a condition that must be met before there is forgiveness, only that if somebody is repentant, then we must forgive. He adds this, if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. 
Now here, it appears that forgiveness is a duty as well as a gift, a duty toward God at minimum. I'm not certain that the offender has a right to be forgiven, even if he repents, so I'm not certain that I have a duty to him to forgive, but I certainly do have a duty to God. If God commands my forgiveness of a repentant offender, then I have to do it, I think. Maybe it's a species of loving our neighbor as ourselves. Maybe it's a species of loving our enemy. In any case, the offender's remorse, and certainly the offender's repentance, is a terrific consideration when it comes to working against my anger. And we all know why. The offender's repentance will soften my hard heart, calm my angry spirit, because now it's clear to me that the offender is looking at the offense from the same side of the line as I am. He sees that he was wrong, or she sees that she was wrong. And it's also clear to me that the offender's repentance is going to go a long way towards softening my hard heart because now there's a shift in the balance of power between us. The offender had used power of some kind or another, intellectual power, emotional power, physical power, to hurt me. I was the victim. But now it's as if the offender is on his knees, asking, saying, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm going to change my life. Could you, would you see your way clear to forgiving me? Now everything's shifted. Now you are in the position of dispensing grace or withholding it, almost like God. A shift in power. There was a, um, an adjudicatory in Maryland some years ago that experimented with um, giving youthful offenders a choice to either be locked up or to go through a repentance ceremony. And if they chose to go through the repentance ceremony, what would happen is that the victim would come with her people and the offender would come to the same place with his people. There would be um, court personnel involved. And the protocol was for the offender to get on his knees in front of his victim and say to her words like, I, am, I offended you when I molested you. What I did was wrong. I should never have done it. I wish so much that I never had done it. And I promise that I am going to try really hard never to do anything like this again. Well, two results of this experiment in offering juvenile offenders their choice between being locked up and going through a repentance ceremony. The ones who chose to go through the repentance ceremony had a dramatically lower level of recidivism than the ones who went to jail. And the second interesting feature of this whole thing is quite a few chose to go to jail. They simply could not conceive of themselves getting on their knees and saying how sorry they were because that's not their portrait of what it was for them to be hard. I'd like to add something. Repentance uh, Remorse and repentance, even if they are genuine and even if they help me soften my hard heart, do not necessarily make me whole, right? I mean, um, if somebody assaults my precious child and is later remorseful and even repentant, that's wonderful. But I and my wife and our child are still going to have to deal with and struggle with the damage for a long time. Indignation is still relevant. There is still much to forgive, but repentance is a softener that is going to help me in due course, by the grace of God, to melt some of my anger. I think I'm up to number eight. And by the way, this is a finite list. You know, this, we're not going to go on all afternoon. Number eight, 
Christians take a long view. We believe that in the end, evil will not win, cannot win. We believe in the victory of Jesus Christ over evil. We believe that in the new heaven and earth, there will be shalom. This enables us to take a partly ironical and partly provisional view of the sins of others against us. Maybe my offender is not repentant. Maybe my offender can't even see that what he did was wrong. I do not have to worry that this edge of the bed cover is going to be untucked in forever. God is just. God knows what to do when there are snarls in human history that have to be combed out. And this is going to help me release part of my anger toward God. My anger toward the offender, release it to God. I take it that's part of what's going on in the prayers of lament within the Psalms. The psalmist just prays his consternation and his anger into the heart of God so that he does not himself have to bear it all by himself. Okay, I've so far spoken of the bases of forgiveness and justification and in dying and rising with Christ, I've restated Bob Roberts' view that what we do when we undertake to forgive somebody is to make a move against our own anger by deliberately bringing to mind heart-softening considerations. I now want to conclude by adding a few other observations about the grace and craft of forgiveness that I think will help fill out the picture a little bit or which are just interesting. And then we'll, of course, have time for discussion. First of these observations is that I am persuaded in looking at the debate over the last 25 years on forgiveness among Christians, I am persuaded that forgiveness is chiefly for the offender and for the sake of my relationship with the offender. That forgiveness is not, first of all, for my sake, getting myself tidied up, making it possible for me to get a night's sleep. It is therapeutically intended but it's not intended primarily to heal my own wounded psyche, but rather to heal a relationship with the offender. Now here things are tricky and much debated as between Bob Roberts and Lou Smeads and between Greg Jones and Lou Smeads. Both Jones and Roberts have in the past accused Smeads of excessive self-interest in his theory of forgiveness as if the main thing we are seeking when we undertake to forgive an offender is our own peace of mind. Well, Smeads replies in his volume titled The Art of Forgiving that the first person who actually benefits from forgiveness is the one who does it. If you release your anger, you are the first person to feel the release and to feel the relief that follows from it. The person you have forgiven might not even yet know that you have forgiven him, or in some cases might not care. And that's true enough. But of course, that's an address to the question, who benefits first chronologically? It may also be true that we cannot do the relationship much good or the offender much good till we have cleared out a good deal of our own anger. That may be true too. but. My question is, who or what is forgiveness ultimately for? Who is the primary intended benefactor of forgiveness? Lou Smeads used to say that this question was unanswerable, that we simply have no choice between self-centered forgiving and other-centered forgiving. I can do you good by forgiving you only if I do myself good by forgiving you. It's life's most happy, vicious circle. Well, maybe so, maybe not. Let's put that into, into suspension for a moment. And notice what I take to be one incontrovertible fact. The scriptural accent marks in forgiveness fall on its grace. Forgiveness is something that is freely and generously given by God. 
And we are entrusted with the glad duty of following suit, of freely and generously treating those who have offended against us. And so in Matthew 18, so in Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other as God in Christ has forgiven you. Forgiveness, I want to say, is a form of grace. Grace is a form of love. And that's, I think, the biblical accent. And it sounds to me then as if the primary benefactor is the offender. But I want to add that in the way God has arranged the world, what's right to do is so often what's wise to do that when we are obedient to Christ by forgiving someone who has offended us, it is not wrong to notice that my blood pressure is going to go down, I'm going to start to sleep nights, the sky is going to start looking bluer. All that means is that by doing what is right, I have re-entered a healthy state of relationship to God and to others. Not wrong to notice that even if the primary benefactor is the offender. The other big accent in both Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 when we're in a forgiveness context is that the reason for all this anger management that's necessary among Christians, you know, um, put to death anger, wrath, malice, etc., clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, four things in a row that have, have to do with managing my anger. The reason this is so urgent is that it is tearing up the community. Anger tears up the community. There's no peace. Forgiveness is for the sake of relationships, for the sake of repairing them, perhaps if the offender is repentant, even restoring them. So when Lewis Smead says, I can do you good by forgiving only if I do myself good by forgiving, I can't disagree, but I do think the accent would be more characteristically biblical if we left ourselves out of the spotlight and turned the spotlight on the maintenance and restoration of peaceful communal relationships in Christ. That's what we're after, even if it means I have to do the hard work of mortifying my anger. Second observation, I think that forgiveness is primarily for the sake of my relationship with the offender. I am aiming primarily at recon reconciliation when I generously let my anger drop. But then notice that forgiveness is only a necessary condition for reconciliation. It's not a sufficient one. In order for there to be reconciliation, the offender has to make a move. The offender has to be remorseful and repentant. And it's really important here for third parties not to forget this. You know, third parties that have leverage on both the offender and the victim will sometimes pretty quickly say to the victim, why don't you forgive him? No, it's not the victim's move. It's the offender's move. The, the ball is in the offender's court if he has hurt somebody. It's the offender's job to be remorseful and repentant. Then we'll see about forgiveness. Third observation, although forgiveness has centrally to do with acting against my anger, it also has something to do with acting against my memory. Here, Miroslav Volf has done some fine thinking and writing. Memory is a huge part of mental life and hugely influential on our happiness. One of my former colleagues at Calvin Seminary used to say, a lot of happiness has to do with how you handle the garbage in your memory. What do we do with the garbage? Well, I guess that we can at minimum try to take some of the garbage out to the curb. We can bracket certain memories or background them. Miroslav Volf likes to write that we can non-remember them. And I think that we have actually done this a lot over our lives. Um, if I were to think back now on the lives of my two boys, 
and what they did when they were young that on any occasion irritated me or even caused anger in me, I can practically not remember any of them. They've all just faded. And I think that that's a, a natural process when you choose for the sake of a relationship not to nurse the memory and certainly not to rehearse it with other people. What that does is keeps it alive. What you do instead is you muscle it aside in your memory or you mentally picture a great big garbage can with a big heavy lid and you put that memory in it and slam that lid down and do that as many times as is necessary until it starts to fade. And lots of people in pastoral relationships will testify that some of the time it works pretty well. God gives grace to people who do not nurse their grievances and who refuse to rehearse them with others. To me, it's striking how often the scriptures do pair up God's forgiving with God's forgetting. God wants to bury our sins in the heart of the sea so that he can't even see them anymore. Wants them out of there. He will remember them no more. Fourth, and I know that I have only four minutes left, some very thoughtful person has placed a clock right here. How about saying the words, I forgive you, to an offender? Could be powerful. At the end of an earnest talk together, he says he's so sorry, and you say, I forgive you. Could be powerful. But you want to think a little. There are some situations in which, especially ones in which the offender is not at all sure that he has done what you think he has done, you have succeeded in dropping your anger, but you might not say that to him because he's not going to hear forgiveness. He's going to hear pity or he's going to hear accusation. And that's not good for him to hear. So I think the words need to be said advisedly. Fifth, I think it's possible to forgive somebody, drop anger, you have a right to, but still not trust this person for a time. One of your kids steals family money for drugs, you forgive your kids, you no longer leave money lying around. I think that makes perfectly good sense. Sixth, forgiving a person does not necessarily mean the relationship goes back to where it was before the offense. It might actually get stronger, as it did between Jacob and Esau, as it did between Joseph and his brothers but it might not actually get stronger. It might go some way past, some way back, so that you can take the Lord's Supper with this person, you can be perfectly civil with this person, but now you don't feel that you can freely laugh with this person anymore. That's just a sad fact. One of my pastors used to remark that Abraham, that Sarah may have forgiven Abraham for trying to pass her off as his sister, but there was always a certain look in her eye after that. Seventh, forgiveness may take a long time. Forgiveness is a journey, said Lou Smeads. The deeper the offense, the longer the journey. Uh, we need a little patience for this journey. There are Christians who think that we can forgive on the spot. I think that there are Christians who are capable of that with a, a Holy Ghost miracle of God. But in my experience, it usually takes some season of wrestling and working the craft before it happens. Finally, this is the last observation, to forgive somebody's offense is not to give permission for repeat instances of it. An offender may like to take permission. You know, he beats his wife. She eventually forgives him, and he takes that as permission to do it again. It isn't. And so it's really important, I think, to remind offenders that they're sorrow for their sin and your forgiveness of them is not permission to do it again. What you need is repentance. What you need is for the beating to stop. 
Okay, what I've wanted to say this afternoon is that forgiveness of those who hurt us is pure liquid grace. The ability to do it is surely God's gift, but it's also our calling, and our calling may be answered by pursuing the craft of forgiveness. But even then, forgiveness raises questions and angularities that guarantee much lively discussion for many years to come. The end. Thank you very much.